and welcome. Uh, I'm uh, Dr. Erin Berman. I'm a clinical psychologist at the National Institute of Mental Health uh, is the intramural program, which is located in uh, Bethesda, Maryland. Um, my specialty, obviously, if you guys are all here today, uh, is on adolescents and children and primarily how you work with them uh, when they kind of have anxiety that is beyond the norm. Um, as I'll discuss, anxiety is obviously a very normal emotion, um, and it's one that's very helpful. But, um, you know, there's times when it can. I'll go over kind of the background, um, some of the neuroscience behind it, and then obviously the strategies that you can help, that can directly help uh, you and your children. Um, so two uh, notes to make. Um, I guess the main one is that um, we will be giving a copy of the PowerPoint out um, after this. Um, uh, Kayleen DeHaut, who helped organize this, will send out an email at the end of the seminar. Um, uh, I make sure, too, as well, that you uh, mute your phones um, when you're calling in. Okay, so I'll get started because we only have an hour, and this is a wonderfully uh, large a topic, um, and there's obviously a lot of interest today. So, um, first off, you know, the reason I'll spend a little bit of time here is twofold. One, um, I'm under the guise of a, a neuroscience lab, a neuro lab where we're looking at the origins and the circuitry of anxiety disorders, specifically in um, kids and adolescents. Um, but also the first step to really any intervention, um, when you go to a psychologist, psychiatrist, a social worker, whoever your therapist is, uh, even this is very important for educators who work with children who have anxiety, uh, anxiety in school, um, focused on schoolwork, um, social anxiety, separation anxiety, so leaving their parents um, and having difficulty transitioning to the new school year. Uh, you start always with having everyone, educators, parents, and the kids understand what is anxiety and where does it come from. As I said at the very beginning, anxiety is incredibly adaptive. Um, it's something we all need to have. Uh, if we don't have it, uh, then we may not get up on time in the morning. Uh, we may not be motivated to study for an exam. Uh, we may not be motivated to fold all that laundry and get everything organized for the next day with kids. Um, so we need a little bit of anxiety. It does drive our behavior. Uh, so it's an adaptive um, feeling. And as we can see there in this picture, uh, this is a classic picture part of uh, the high road and low road um, I guess, model of anxiety and where it comes from uh, by an individual called Joseph Ledoux, L-E-D-O-U-X, if anyone is interested, obviously, in the real uh, nitty-gritty uh, details of this model. Um, but what it did highlight is at some point that we know the amygdala uh, tends to be one of the main centers of anxiety. Uh, so in this picture, you can see that that circle, there's a blue circle, that's where our amygdala is located. We actually have two, one on either side of the brain, and that is really uh, the part that processes anxiety, um, but there's obviously other ones. You know, the brain is very interconnected, so we don't want to say it's just one, but this is kind of one of the main players in understanding uh, anxiety and anxiety disorders. So what we can see are there are two roads. The most important thing to understand is there's a very clear image and a very jumbled image. Um, so the upper snake, which you can see, which is right above the amygdala, um, if you don't have the PowerPoint, <laughs> I'm sorry, right now if you're just listening, but it's a jumbled kind of image of a snake. Um, and then there is a lower road, which is actually a slower road. So if you can see uh, images come in through the eyes, obviously, but what's fascinating about visual information is it's processed all the way back to the visual cortex is actually in the back of our head. Um, and even more interestingly, um, images come in upside down pretty much. They go to the back of the head, uh, they flip around, and then we process them. So that amygdala then processes it um, and says, oh, that's a snake, we should run. Um, what you know, was found is that there were two ways to process it. There's a very clear way of seeing it and then a jumbled way. That's kind of the way um, a lot of you are parents where, you know, you see something out of the corner of your eye or your kid's about to fall out of your chair, their chair or their swing and you run and kind of like, you know, you put your arms out, you have a good save in other words. It's just very quick processing. Um, and all sensory information does go through, you can see there's a thalamus 
that's even above the amygdala. Um, and that, but they have a, there's a visual thalamus, auditory thalamus, so all sensory information that would trigger an anxiety response goes through a, a thalamus. Um, and then it goes down through the um, amygdala and down through your body. Uh, you can see the two images below the brain. Below the little brain stem uh, is a heart rate it's talking about, and it's talking about kind of your muscles getting in gear to fight or flight. Um, but what, again, you want to take from this is that there's a very clear picture sometimes of what is scaring us and sometimes not so clear. And what has been found in research is that individuals with anxiety, and specifically anxiety disorders, successive anxiety, uh, tend to have a bit of a sensitive amygdala. So it's going off too much of the time, and it may be signaling too much threat when there really isn't threat. Uh, we call it a bias towards threat, um, where individuals, you know, you think about your kids who are socially anxious, you know, who are worried about how others perceive them, um, how others see them, or sounding dumb. You know, they're the ones that perceive someone's face, maybe it's just even a neutral looking face, not a smile or a frown, as threatening. Um, and that's what I mean, there seems to be some quick processing and that's what uh, we are studying uh, with our group at the NIMH. The other part of the brain that I really want to start to talk about is the front of the brain for many reasons. Uh, what we want to do uh, when we do things um, involved with therapy and in improving our ability to cope with anxiety is really engage the front of our brain. Uh, that's our executive functioning. Um, it's where we have um, abstract thinking. I really like the idea of it as the brain uh, CEO. It really takes in all the information from all the different lobes, whether it's visual, whether it's word, and kind of is able to execute or get everything out. Um, it's for future-oriented thinking. Um, it helps you entertain hypothetical situations. Um, and what happens when we're anxious is that base amygdala turns on and we are not so good at thinking things through. So we really want to be able to engage that more. Um, as you can see, this image, I do like this because it shows you where the fight or flight areas are engaged. Um, and as we said, it's not simply just the amygdala. Um, it's called subcortical region. Um, there's a thalamus hippocampus, which is a very interesting structure. We won't go into a lot of details because obviously we want to get right to the interventions, but that's where memory comes from. Um, brainstem, hypothalamus, immobilizes the body to get it moving, um, and that is where we get our kind of anxiety and possibly almost our anxiety attacks, as you can see. It's your heart increases, your respiratory rate changes, your muscle tone, you get tense. Um, and this nature of the system, as it says, is to bypass the front of the brain. So when we have too much anxiety, we are not thinking things through. <laughs> Bottom line, that's what this uh, slide is all about. Um, so what is our first step to an intervention? Let's get right there. Um, we want to educate kids, you guys, uh, parents, uh, educators as well, or anyone who, who works with them, uh, coaches, um, and normalize the anxiety. Just by simply explaining this to children, like this is your amygdala, it's going off too much, in these certain situations, help them identify those situations which they might occur. We call them in therapy triggers, but you can simply just call them where their anxiety occurs. Uh, but we want to normalize that anxiety. Uh, we want them to understand that these feelings are not dangerous um, and many times are helpful, but maybe are happening too often to these kids with anxiety disorders and maybe at too strong of an intensity for them to ignore. And our job is to help them deal with those feelings. So let them know that they are not the only one Everyone has anxiety. So one great way, a lot of parents ask me, how do you get your child, some kids will just say, I feel anxious. And some kids won't be able to identify what scares them and it'll be your job or the therapist or coach or teacher to help you identify that. Um, but really self-disclosing when you felt anxious um, is incredibly helpful. Because uh, then children get to see oh, okay, so this isn't such a weird thing. I'm not weird. Because they all feel weird or different or alone because they're the only ones feeling uncomfortable in a new school. They think everyone else is okay or feeling scared when they leave their mom and dad. So everyone has anxiety and many children actually do as well have excessive anxiety. Um, so that is really super, super important as your first step to helping a kid. That will also open the door for them talking to you a lot more and sharing where they feel anxious. I find it incredibly useful as well in therapy to self-disclose small amounts um, that can help connect with the children. So the other image I really do like to show um, is that this is a very physiological type of response. Um, so they're not making it up when they have stomach aches, headaches, 
um, nausea, all those things are really a product of the brain and, what, and this system turning on. So these are all the different types of physical symptoms of anxiety. I'll read them quickly in case you don't have the slide. Um, tightness or pain in chest, sweating, dizziness or lightheadedness, heart racing, feeling faint. Those are all the things that you can also have, obviously, difficulties with sleeping. Um, a little bit, it can look like you have hyperactivity in a way. Um, some people, which we don't go into some of these, but um, some of my older clients, meaning my adolescents, will have things like derealization and depersonalization with panic attacks. Um, there's a large laundry list of physical symptoms. But what is really neat about this image is you can Google simply the anatomy of fear and you can get this image. I print it out and I like to give it to uh, any of the kids that I work with um, so they can really understand. And again, it helps them normalize and help them realize that this is something that turns on, but it does end. So most importantly, if you are on the receiving end of a panic attack, um, so your child's freaking out, um, your friend is, your partner, um, you have to know you cannot stop it and do not try and stop it. Um, I always give, you know, the very famous experiment that I love to talk about, which is, um, you know, we can all do it together, and probably a lot of you have heard of this, is close your eyes right now. Uh, since you're all sitting by yourselves, maybe you'll do it. Usually when I do it at a large group, people are not <laughs> so apt to do this. But you can close your eyes right now and just follow what I'm saying. Uh, this will only take about 10 seconds. What I want you to do right now is imagine a white bear. A big white bear. Now, do not let it come into your head. Do not imagine that white bear. Do not see a white bear, and do not let it have a big pink bow. And what happens is, most likely you all, hopefully, all see that, that white bear. So meaning when you have an anxiety attack, we cannot stop it. Telling them stop, calm down, it's okay, those are not helpful things. You just want to remind them that it does end. So if you can see my third thing on there, that is the only thing you really do want to say. <laughs> we know this ends. Uh, just stay with me right now. Um, you can, if you're in a really tricky situation, you can distract the kids. Um, you know, let's go take a walk. Um, let's try and, you know, think about something else. But more important, just let them listen. Let them freak out. Um, be the calming influence. So that doesn't mean saying, it's okay, this will never happen again, um, you know, you have nothing to be worried about because they feel worried, so that's invalidating. Uh, it possibly could happen again and again, so we don't want to say that. Um, but we don't want to freak out because if they're panicked and then you're panicked, everybody panics. So really important that it remind them that it ends. Um, I had a session the other evening, same thing, a little girl um, just started middle school, a lot of stress in the family, um, and really reported all of a sudden after having a pretty intense day, not a lot of good sleep, just having a panic attack. They usually, uh, in their essence, last 10 to 15 minutes. Um, the real physical symptoms, uh, the kids usually feel like they need to go to the hospital or that they may die as well. So those are the feelings, and you need to just be calm and reassuring in a behavioral way and not using a lot of words. So are you okay? Um, so someone just asked the question, uh, is, if you can say, are you okay? You know, you, you could do that. Um, I think, you know, that wouldn't harm them. Um, but we also don't want to bring too much attention to what's going on. We want them to kind of ride the wave. So if it's just a quick check-in and you think the kid will get stuck there, because well, most likely they'll be like, no, I'm not okay. So, you know, you're welcome to say it. I don't think it's a harmful thing to say at all, uh, but it may increase it a little bit more. We want them to just understand that it does stop. Um, about after 15 minutes. You may still feel anxious for the rest of the afternoon, but those symptoms will end. And no one has ever died of anxiety uh, or an anxiety attack, um, and it, you can't stay at that level forever. So. Great comments. Thank you. Um, so this is just a quick, uh, I don't want to spend too much time on this. This is what uh, we are currently doing within our group at the NIMH. This is um, attention bias uh, retraining, um, and, and essentially what we're trying to do is when we uh, looked at a bunch of neuroimaging uh, fMRI, which means functional magnetic resonance imaging, fMRI um, scans and studies that we did, um, it was known that individuals with anxiety disorders, if kind of given a choice, um, meaning if they see a neutral face or an angry face uh, in the scanner, um, their eyes, their gaze, or their attention will go towards the angry face. They tend to not pay attention, for lack of a better word, to the neutral or even a positive face. 
So we're trying to get them to train this quick processing, like we're showing that quick road of processing of anxiety where you don't, can't really see what's going on. Um, and it's almost an unconscious processing. You know, we could say Freud had some, um, you know, understanding of what was going on. There is this very quick base processing in the brain of children with anxiety disorders. And so they would go towards the negative versus a neutral or positive image. So this you can see, this shows the milliseconds. That's how quick it's presented. So it's presented very, very quickly. The children uh, do this in our studies before um, a session of cognitive behavioral therapy and after a session of cognitive behavioral therapy. Um, and we're hoping it's an adjunct um, and will help improve treatment outcome and treatment response uh, when within the context of therapy. So it's called attention, attention bias training. Um, and from some of the studies that were already done, um, there is some to be some benefit compared to a placebo. Um, and let's get on to the real nitty gritty of the anxiety disorders. Um, so there's a high, obviously, prevalence rate. Uh, 18, 8 to 20% of teens uh, have an anxiety or depressive disorder at one time. Uh, the comorbidity is huge, meaning uh, once you have one disorder, you're more likely to have a lot more. So 65 to 84 um, percent. So once you could have social anxiety and ADHD, uh, social anxiety uh, and be on the spectrum. Social anxiety and depression, um, you know, they all tend to hang together. Um, and that's why it's a very diffuse the brain, and that's why we want to say, yes, we know the amygdala is where anxiety does um, have some origin, but we believe it's obviously a very diffuse circuitry that's going on. Uh, what's also important to see is there's also, just to let you know the rate of ADHD, because that's kind of the main one people focus on, honestly, in schools. Uh, anxiety kind of goes to the side of the road for a few reasons. Um, one, the anxious kids are not as out there. Um, the anxiety is an internalizing disorder. So as you all know, um, you know, if you have kids with anxiety, a lot of stuff's going on in their heads and you're not seeing it. A lot of these kids are the compliant, perfectionistic, uh, quiet kids, so they don't pop out as much, but it's obviously a much more higher rate of prevalence than um, even ADHD. Um, but uh, ADHD goes, ADHD and anxiety also go hand in hand very much together. So when does anxiety become a disorder? As we said, we normalize it. Um, there's a lot of individuals with anxiety. Um, uh, the other day I interviewed a kid who had a lot of anxiety, but only simply around test taking, um, and it would only happen a day or two before. It was debilitating in the sense that um, he, you know, had difficulty concentrating during the test, but that didn't fall under the realm of the disorder because he didn't worry about it every day or it didn't have such a strong reaction. He still was able to go to school. Um, so this is, that's a, a level of anxiety that's problematic, but not a disorder. So we'll talk when does it become a disorder, when you have a lot of avoidance. Um, versus approach, uh, really important for you to realize and kind of keep your eyes on. Uh, anxious kids are quiet. They're internal in a lot of their things. Um, you also can have loud anxious kids for sure, um, but a lot of them are, you know, processing so much inside that their avoidance, they subtly start to avoid things. That's really your first key that your child may have an anxiety disorder. They may start to come up with more than just a few days that they're sick or reasons they can't go to school. Uh, they may slowly start to withdraw from different activities. You know, oh, I don't like, or come up with kind of, for lack of a better word, excuses. I don't really like that word, but that's just to help you look for those things. Oh, I don't want to go to class today, you know. There's nothing we're really learning, you know. Or, oh, you know, that teacher, I don't need to talk to her because she's really not very nice. And maybe you know she's... Most teachers are pretty decent. There's obviously always a few that might be a little cranky, but you, the, jo the, the job does entail that you can go talk to them, so they're pretty open to that. Um, but if you start to hear excuses or reasons to avoid situations, oh, I don't want to go to that friend's party, it's not going to be any fun. Um, or there's too many kids there. Um, so things that they want to be doing, they aren't doing, or things they need to be doing. So in the need realm is obviously um, going to school. So when you see avoidance of school, uh, school work, uh, school activities, that can be a big red flag. Um, you know, you don't need to have friends, but it's very, very helpful. Um, you pretty much need to at least have a few would be helpful. Um, so when you see in social situations them avoiding or backing off, um, and then in terms of separation anxiety disorder, um, when they're avoiding being in certain aspects of the house or certain situations alone. So you see a lot of avoidance when it becomes a disorder. Um, interference, so usually that's when we see the kids, the parents are realizing they're managing a lot all day long. 
Um, so they're managing, you know, trying to get the kid to school when they're avoiding or trying to get them to the club or trying to help them have a play date or trying to help them sleep. Sleep is a huge complaint um, or really problem um, for both parents and kids uh, with anxiety disorders. So it starts to really interfere in the life of the family and the parents. Um, and distress. Um, you know, these are the kids that many times will hold it together at school, and when they come home, they just fall apart for you. Uh, they've, you know, been processing so much, um, and as we know, being in school is probably a very anxiety-provoking situation for most kids with anxiety disorders. Um, you know, the big three anxiety disorders are social anxiety, and there's obviously people <laughs> in school, so there you go. They have the crazy triggers there. Uh, the second one is generalized anxiety. These kids worry about how good they are, their performance. Um, they go to worst-case scenarios, and obviously school has to do with performance and how, you know, what, what the future looks like. Uh, and separation anxiety disorder, those kids obviously are separating from their parents, and that can be hard. And lastly, uh, we obviously, it is not uncommon when there is a large news event, uh, either a natural disaster or regretfully, you know, shootings, that a kid might be, have an increase in anxiety. And that would not necessarily, you know, warrant an anxiety disorder um, if it's persistent. So if you see it going on for more than a couple months, um, when kids first start school, obviously, they may have anxiety massive anxiety for the first month, but if they're making it to school, going through the day, and it's slowly, slowly getting better, then I wouldn't be worried so much, but it's very persistent, or persistent in the sense that, like, you know, maybe they have one bad week, one good week, but then one, two bad weeks, one good week, that you're seeing these symptoms last for about three months then, if you're seeing it on and off, but you're seeing it on and off for about three months, um, so that's when it becomes a disorder. Uh, as I was saying, problems tend to be less apparent with youth uh, versus youth with behavioral disorders. That's uh, ADHD, conduct disorder, oppositional defiant disorder. Um, children may appear perfectionist, um, good kids, but actually can perform pretty poorly in school. So as we were saying, my favorite, not my favorite, but the most important thing is the avoidance. Um, by not doing homework uh, can be a sign of an anxiety disorder. They're avoiding the thing that makes them really uncomfortable. So they may be kids that are good, um, can do well in school, but they're not um, because of doing homework, making a mistake, having to ask questions. Um, homework is very loaded sometimes for these anxious kids. These kids obviously have a lot of somatic complaints, stomach aches, headaches. Um, also, you may see, like I said, sleep disturbances, um, and it also can present as oppositional behavior, um, such as, as through avoidance of tasks, meaning sometimes teachers may say, I don't know why they're not completing their homework, I don't know why they're listening, I don't know why they're staying in the back of the room, um, and they can look like they don't want to try or they don't want to be in school when clearly uh, it is the anxiety and not just a, it's not just like they're trying to be oppositional. So these are our anxiety disorders. Um, separation anxiety, generalized anxiety disorder, social anxiety disorder, specific phobia, a panic disorder. Uh, the top three are the ones that we study all in conjunction, separation anxiety, generalized anxiety, and social anxiety. A specific phobia will also fall into there. Um, we, I won't go into too much details about that, but that can be debilitating in school. Um, a very a couple common specific phobias that do become debilitating to children are vomit phobias. Um, they may refuse school, worrying that someone may throw up or that they may get sick. Um, uh, natural disasters are like thunderstorms storms, um, you know, we're kind of, we're in D.C., so we're kind of through the, um, the storm season almost, um, but that can be a hard time for kids. Uh, they can avoid doing things outside because of the clouds they see, et cetera. Um, so specific phobia can actually really, you know, uh, prevent uh, functioning as well. And panic disorder, we don't go over that too much um, because it's more prevalent in the, in the older, the adolescents, um, but that, to remember, I won't go over it, but it's, it's a fear of fear. So the fear of having another panic attack. Uh, so separation, incredibly common. Um, fears of either themselves, uh, monsters, illnesses, natural disasters, driving safeties. These are the kids that, thank God for the phone, um, they're very happy about that. They can text mom. Uh, they also can see when mom read that text to make sure she's alive, or dad, or grandma, or whoever's kind of their main person they're worried about. Um, you know, they will also be the ones that call, and when you're in a meeting, you will see three missed calls because they didn't know where you were. Um, these will also be the kids that follow you around the house. You know, they do not want to go in the basement, and as I always say, not a scary basement, a finished basement, um, or they won't want to go upstairs and take a shower by themselves or be in their rooms or get dressed. 
Uh, so you can see how this can really impact the family, um, and it really limits where the child can go. Um, you know, what's important to note too is some of these kids, uh, the avoidance gets very tricky. So uh, some of my favorite stories are, there was one little girl, I think she was probably eight or nine, and make sure, just so you know, it can, I see them as young as seven or eight and as old as 18 years old, so you definitely can have that. Um, the little eight-year-old, though, uh, was very clever in that she had a four-year-old sister. Um, and obviously they, you know, they got along and they were very close. Um, they shared a room, which isn't uncommon. Um, but she, the eight-year-old eventually convinced the four-year-old to share the bed with her. Um, and then always I asked her, well, you know, why do you feel safe when she's in there? And she said, well, I put my four-year-old sister on the outside of the bed because uh, then if the monster comes, it will come and take her first. Um, so they are very clever. Um, they're very on top of it, and they know how to avoid in a very uh, good way. Um, you know, it's effective. Avoidance, obviously, if you are a child, the only way you know how to deal with anxiety is to stay away from what scares you. So why we really want to tackle avoidance. The other way they can avoid things is by never kind of being alone or feeling or tolerating the feeling of anxiety. So for your part as a parent, the essential part of treatment with these kids uh, that a lot of people don't touch upon, so you can do, we'll talk about how you can think it through more clearly, how you can help calm down with relaxation, but you have to address the reassurance seeking that you're doing. It is very natural as a parent. Your job is to reassure your child that things are okay. However, <laughs> this is the wrong thing to say, that down there everything is going to be okay. It's completely the wrong thing to say to an anxious, an anxiety disordered child. It will never quell it. It will never stop it. It will never make it. So we want to put it on them in a good way. So the common reassurance type behaviors uh, that we see in separation, again, the checking in, um, the looking for, um, you know, reassurance that mom is alive by calling multiple times, by responding to texts on time, by, I had a wonderful um, little girl who they were in an apartment and you still can have separation anxiety. She would call to her mom when she just couldn't see her. Mom, where are you? And she'd have to say all the time, I'm in this room, I'm in that room. And you could still have it in a very small space. Uh, asking safety related questions. Are you sure lock, you locked the door? Um, how far are you traveling for work? When there's a lot of questions and a lot of checking in, uh, the key is not to say that everything is going to be okay. The key is two things. One, if your kid is doing this a lot, you want to slowly pare down. Okay, I will only be able to answer the question, um, you know, two times a day. So if they're constantly asking, is someone going to break in? We don't just cut them off right away and say, I'm never going to answer that question again. Uh, you would first say, well, you know what? You seem to be asking about four or five times today. We'll talk about it twice. And then if they ask the third time, you say, you know the answer. That's one nice way that you could do it. Um, eventually, though, you would not want to answer it at all. Uh, why? Because I'm sure, as all of you are good parents, you have a safe home for them, bottom line. Obviously, if there's dangers around the home, that's a totally different thing, and it's not separation anxiety. Um, do not say, trust me, it will all be okay. Um, don't say, why are you worrying? You know, again, you know you have a safe home. There's nothing to be scared of. They're feeling scared. Um, and this last one is more for the generalized anxiety kids, what we'll get to next, the ones that are worried about school and performance. Um, I have to say here a million times over that my generalized anxiety kids and my separation kids do not want to hear that it's okay or why you're worrying. They know that intellectually. So your job is to put it on them. Uh, you can ask some questions. That's one way to do it. So I guess you're feeling scared. Um, what has happened before? You know, do you... Think, um, what are some other ways you can think about feeling scared right now? And that's where you can help them understand, oh, this is my anxiety. This is a false alarm, or kind of name it then. That would be a really good next step. Name what is going on. Um, you know, this is, let them know it's an anxiety problem. Um, kids really do like the analogy of false alarm or broken fire alarm. Um, and once she, that's why we talked at the beginning about really educating them. Getting that step down will allow you to not have to say, these types of things. Uh, so as we were just alluding to back there, why are you worried you do so well in school? Um, a lot of perfectionistic kids, kids with really bad um, GAD, um, generalized anxiety disorder, um, still, no matter how well they do, um, they cannot stop the worry. That's the key with this. It's excessive, uncontrollable worry that is not linked to one situation. So like I explained, uh, I did have a boy that came in simply worried about test taking. Um, that did not count 
for generalized anxiety disorder. It was impairing, and I did recommend that he go speak with someone, um, but it wasn't generalized anxiety. This has to go more than one situation or event. So uh, they usually might worry about how they're performing, uh, how others see them. Um, they're uber conscientious sometimes. They want to please, they're the people pleasers. They want to please everyone. They don't want anyone to be upset. Um, as I said, the range of worry can go from health of family members um, to tests at school to future events to um, the economy <laughs> to the general election. Some of them will be worrying about that probably coming up uh, to worrying about the ecosystem and the environment. Um, worrying about genetically modified, you know, um, seeds. Oh, I've heard kind of it all recently. Um, so these kids uh, in general, you know, one child was eight years old, was very perfectionistic, needed to do well in school, stayed up too late studying. That's how he kind of overcompensated for the worry, but also would worry about his grandmother's diabetes and check in on her regularly. <laughs> Sweet at first, uh, but then he really realized that that's not his role in that sense. And then he'd worry about her and her how her health was. And then he'd worry about the money and his parents' money, and we go on from there. Um, they're self-critical, so these kids do run the risk of uh, being depressed. Um, you know, as we said, the perfectionism, they can either honestly totally fail out at things uh, because it's just too hard to even start um, a paper. Um, a lot of these kids may have difficulties doing papers um, because there's so many components that's kind of open-ended versus just doing tests. Um, or you can have the overachievers, straight-A kids, too. Um, they're really worried about what will happen in the future. So here we have, they are, test anxiety is one component. Um, and they usually expect the worst. So I'm going to fail. It's going to be terrible. I'll need to repeat the grade. If I fail, I'm a bad person. So helping them, like we said, educate. Help them label. So with the separation anxiety, we talked about it as being a false alarm. Um, with worry, we want them to understand, because a lot of these kids, we're kind of born this way. So they've lived with at least the underpinnings of worry for a long time. Uh, sometimes you don't see it really kind of burst out into a bigger problem until middle school, um, you know, or high school. But they've always had these kind of sounds of worry. Um, this first one is obviously the very zen uh, mindfulness kind of way of dealing with worry. It is really a great way to deal with it. It's sometimes very, very difficult for the younger kids. Um, it's really letting you understand that we're not here to stop anxiety. We do not want to ever also tell them we never want to get rid of anxiety all the way. Uh, one of my clients that I've had for many years will always ask, you know, when is it going to end? Um, you know, it'll ebb and flow for some time. So let the thought come and go. Don't try and stop it. Don't push the pause button. Don't try and force it out and play out the movie. Uh, we don't want to say, let's stop it. I can't take it. This is too much. It's back to that white bear experiment. It will keep coming back more and more and more. Um, so if you can get to that Zen way, please try and do that. Um, the second one is relabeling it. Um, I love this one. This one's obviously very good for kids and even adults. It's not me. It's worry. Um, so that's another way you can respond when the kids come to you with five million worries. You can say, that sounds, I know you're stressed. Uh, I know you have a lot to do. So you want to, again, always empathize first. And then say, you know, I think that's your worry. That sounds a lot like your worry whenever you go to the worst case scenario or whenever you go to mommy dying in a car wreck. Uh, we know that's your tends to be your worry. Um, right now, you're not in any danger, so you can help them bring them to the promise, like the present moment. Um, that's why you're not reassuring them that everything will be okay in the future because you cannot do that. So that's why we don't want you to say those things. But you can say, I'm not weird. Um, those are for maybe the socially anxious kids. I'm not dumb for the socially anxious kids because they're worried about being dumb or perceived as dumb. I'm not in danger or I'm not whatever. You figure out what that anxiety is signaling them. Blank is a false alarm. So this worry is a false alarm. That one is really fantastic. Uh, that is the way you're going to get a good handle on the uh, anxiety and worry. So memorize that slide. <laughs> um, no, don't worry, you'll get them. Uh, so school anxiety disorder, uh, social anxiety disorder is more common in adolescence. Uh, it seems to peak right around then. Uh, it's obviously excessive fear of social evaluation, uh, embarrassment, doing something that would be perceived as them not knowing what they're doing, not performing up to certain standards. Um, social anxiety can look very different depending on the child. Um, so many times people will say, well, she must not have any social anxiety, she can get up and perform. And time and time again, I will hear that, you know, nope, I can get up and sing in front of a crowd or I can get up and do a play in front of the crowd because it's all rehearsed. 
I've done it a million times. Um, it also can go the other way. Socially anxious kids can want to perform but can't because they're afraid of all those eyes on them. Okay, so that can either one of those kids can have social anxiety disorder. Very important to remember. Also, sometimes socially anxious kids are only anxious. They're fine with adults. So the parent says, well, they seem okay. They talk to me. They talk to my friends. They talk to the cashier. But they're not comfortable with their peers. That's more common than the other way around where they're comfortable with their peers, but they won't talk to adults. But that definitely is prevalent as well. Where you'll see that as being an issue is whether they have to ask about um, school-related issues or activity-related issues. They don't want to talk to those adults that they need to be able to talk to. So social anxiety is a very important one to address. It really can make their world very, very small um, and make really school very difficult. Um, socially, um, they will be stunted if it's, they have issues with their peers, but also in terms of problem solving. Um, if they can't go to a teacher, they can't ask what they're doing is right, right or wrong, uh, they'll have a very difficult time moving forward in school. So it's a really good one to kind of nip in the bud. Um, this is real quickly, um, some of you may have kids that have both anxiety plus ADHD. Um, you have to do this. Um, so fascinating, you know, I um, have always been treating individuals with anxiety disorders for actually quite some time. But I've only been a mother for the last, you know, three years. Um, and, and I have to say, you know, this, uh, the stuff about the anxiety and the stuff that I've learned uh, all, you know, you, that, that I knew and that works. Um, but what's really important, I think, to know is that paying positive attention to your kids um, if you want them to not be uh, as irritable and cranky and non-compliant, which you will get with an anxious kid as well, they don't even necessarily have to have ADHD, uh, that has worked wonders. The other thing that I've learned um, that's gone in context with having uh, doing this type of treatment and having kids get better is any new behavior takes many months to establish. Um, so my daughter went from a crib <laughs> to a bed. You know, I thought, okay, after two weeks, you know, just being consistent, going in there, reminding her to stay in there, it would be fine. It took three months. Um, that's about what we say. This treatment actually takes three to six months. Um, it did take three months, and then, like, you know, a night ago, she came in halfway through the night. So it's just, I think it's the really thing, the good thing to remember is that all of this stuff works really well. Now I know how to practically uh, implement it, and the practicalities are it takes time, all these skills. So you have to repeat it. You have to be consistent. You have to be as positive as you can be. Uh, but sometimes it's impossible, and that's fair. <laughs> you can have a bad day. Um, really important to all kids, but specifically ones with anxiety and ADHD, do not talk too much. Uh, be short and straightforward. Limit the number of tasks if you're asking them to do something or asking them to implement a new skill that you're learning in therapy, one skill at a time. Um, clear and consistent expectations, and obviously make sure that, you know, sometimes, especially with the ADHD kids, they're going to take even longer. So if it takes three months with a kid who doesn't have ADHD, give it five months for the ones with ADHD. Um, and just, then you won't be as frustrated. Um, I wish I could go a whole lecture on how to uh, take care of yourself as a parent, but we're focusing on how you can help your kids today. Um, so what, you know, what are other good strategies? Uh, we talked about educating the kids. We talked about externalizing the anxiety. That means giving it a name. Um, you know, we talked about uh, dropping uh, the reassurance or the saying you're okay. Uh, another skill, so this is our fourth one we'll come to today, is challenging anxious thoughts. So is there another way to view things? You know, just ask them, oh, gosh, the end of the world is coming. Well, is there another way? I mean, do you think the end of the world is coming? You want to be a curious parent to help them get to their own answer. Think of the pros and cons of a situation. This can be more in the social anxiety disorder. So you have to go ask your teacher um, about this question. So the pros are, well, if I ask her, um, actually I may learn something. Uh, I can get credit for something I missed. The cons are she'll think I'm not very smart. You know, and so help them understand, you know, these are the pros and cons that sometimes can help motivate their behavior. And consider the big picture, which may, may help provide um, perspective to things. When life is uncertain, um, you have to give the big picture. And that big picture can be something to the effect of, you know, well, let's think how many times these bad things have happened. You know, and just have them kind of understand the big, you know, how many times are people really injured in car accidents that you know. You know, um, and if that is something, so sometimes there are trauma histories and that you would address a little differently. 
Um, you would, if it happened recently where there's someone they knew had a car accident or got hurt or um, was killed for some unfortunate reason, you would say sometimes these things happen um, and you would make them understand that this, this is how you would cope with it. Instead of focusing on why and how and all the details of it, you'd want them to understand that people cope. Although when bad things do happen, we can cope and there's lots of examples you can probably personally give with that. Uh, where do you really see, um, when I was alluding to uh, getting my daughter to sleep through the night in her bed and not get out, um, it was really was uh, more than telling her. Um, I mean, she's three, she doesn't really, can't really tell her. Um, but it's really the, the behavioral stuff, and we also see that when it comes to doing uh, this type of therapy, cognitive behavioral therapy, is the behavioral component is incredibly powerful. We want the kids to do what scares them. So that would mean if they're a separation kid and they don't want to go upstairs by themselves, uh, at nighttime, we'd start in a very small step. So my easy one is, okay, you don't like to go upstairs, everyone's on the main floor, all I want you to do every night is go up and down the stairs, don't even have to like stop, a couple times when it's dark out, okay? Next step would be go all the way up to the top of the stairs, stand there for five seconds, come down. Okay, now let's switch to the basement. The basement's always a really good one. What I tend to find is a lot of people that have, like, good things. They usually have good things in the basement. That's usually sometimes where the freezer is, you know, where there's ice cream, frozen pizzas, all that good stuff. I mean, this in a good way. You can kind of, like, trick them to go down there, you know, I mean, tell them, okay, you will have to help out, go down there, and then you'll come up with an ice cream, you know, something like that. Um, I am, uh, you know, I, I understand, I think having rewards that are inherent in the step are better. So obviously helping out at the house and getting ice cream and bringing it up uh, versus just a basic reward is better. So finding, you know, those type of opportunities are good. Um, you know, obviously if you are asking the kid to do it, you have to be able to do it, which most parents can. Um, I run into this more issues when there's a specific phobia, like of spiders or bees, a uh, kid might be. Uh, a parent might be a little nervous, and so you have to model it first, or as I always say, more importantly, if you have your child in therapy, you want the therapist to at least offer uh, to do it first. I always, anything I ask them do. So with my socially anxious kids, you know, we do want them to go. Uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the real nuts and bolts of cognitive behavioral therapy. We want to go them, them to go to a little bit of an extreme when they are in therapy with me, uh, not they have to do it every day in their life. Uh, so that may mean uh, they might have to walk around with two silly socks on, you know, and see if people really stare. Or, um, you know, the idea is with a socially anxious kid, they're afraid of having eyes on them or people look at them or being perceived as silly. Um, and so I will always do what I'm asking the kid to do. Uh, so model it first or tell them times that you uh, experienced something scary and how you overcame it. Um, gently encourage them to try new things and new behaviors. So the more you push them to do new little new things every day, the less and less fear will set in. Um, let's see, I just want to make sure I have this. Okay. So when you do a fear hierarchy, uh, this is um, more even for the professionals or individuals that kind of want to try and create, you want to help the kids, you want to anchor them in um, how th scary things are. If you just say how scary you on a scale of one to 10, they're not gonna know. I mean, they may say five and their five may be mine too or their 10. Um, so you want them to know that, you know, I use an image or I tell them one means doing their favorite thing like hanging out, you know, playing Minecraft. Um, 10 would be um, so anxious that you're running or crying or, you know, um, if you have a needle phobia, maybe passing out or, you know, throwing up. Uh, five would be you can do it, but you're starting to feel whatever the physical symptoms that the kid's feeling. So you want them to start to, that's how you create kind of your hierarchy. Um, and this is what I'm just going to show you one because that's going to be easier. So this is for um, a kid uh, who had separation anxiety disorder um, and we found it very difficult for mom uh, to leave any time at all away. Um, uh, and when I say walks the dog, that meant out going out to the backyard and coming back. That's why that was a one. Uh, so they put the dog on a leash, the kid stayed in the house, mom walked through the backyard and back. Um, then the kid, mom stays in the house, or mom actually stayed to the front of the house, the girl went out the back door um, and walked the dog because she said, oh, it'll be good if I have somebody or something with me. Um, having mom go to the store for 10 minutes, it was right, it was literally a minute away. Um, she stayed home obviously with dad, not leaving her by herself, she was a little on the younger side. Um, and mom being gone with no contact for 10 minutes. Um, as I was saying, sometimes that quick text response, some kids really want that quick call or text response. Um, delaying a text response with a four on her scale. Um, receiving only one text a day was a five on her scale. 
Um, some kids will use a lot of phrases to invoke reassurance. So they'll be like, I love you, I love you, and then looking for them to, you to say, I love you back. That may help. So she would say it a lot. She really, you know, giving it, only, letting her only say it once was hard. Um, mom taking a long random walk around the neighborhood. Uh, no texting at all for a day, um, having mom just go out and like have a day on her own. Um, as you can say, number 10, that was very helpful. Mommy was very helpful after that. As she was saying she was a prisoner kind of in her own home, um, but that kind of idea was the, the top of the hierarchy for this girl. It just shows you, uh, you want to start little. Uh, this is kind of how I would do it for, uh, hopefully none of you have spider phobias at the moment or you're going straight through your hierarchy. Um, Right there, that top one, I always start with, you know, you always start super easy because then the kids feel super accomplished. Like, oh, they're like, I can't look at any picture of a spider. And I was like, well, what if it's a cartoon one? So obviously I show them that one. The next one obviously would be a more realistic cartoon image. Um, the third one, I had a needle phobic kid uh, recently. What we did is obviously we did like a drawing one first that he saw, then a cartoon one, then we brought one in but within the package, you know, and so that's, you know, how you would work with the needle phobia. This is for a spider. Hopefully you're getting kind of the idea. You want to go really, really slow. You don't want to freak the kids out because um, then they won't feel too. They won't feel accomplished and two, they will run away from you and not do this at all. Um, so this is what we know works pretty darn well. Um, we're still really trying to refine it. That's why we're working on the attention retraining, which is what we do. Um, and obviously lots of other people are looking at different areas of the brain and, and the different connectivity issues. But what we know from research uh, is that SSRIs uh, do help. Those are drugs um, that are selective serotonin reuptake inhibitors. They help regulate neurotransmitters and they're generally well tolerated and they've been studied fairly well um, and been around for some time um, to treat kids and adolescents. Um, therapy is obviously very important as well. Um, what has been shown research-wise is they compared medication uh, to therapy, and in this case it's cognitive behavioral therapy, um, to placebo, meaning just a sugar pill, to um, uh, therapy plus medication, so therapy plus an SSRI. And those studies have found that kind of the best um, approach, uh, the strongest approach, um, I guess would be the combination of medication plus therapy. Um, obviously therapy and actually therapy and medication like alone, so just therapy and just medication also both did equally well. They had about a rate of about 55% to about 63% and you got a little bit more with combination. Uh, combination is good when you have a child who has difficulty doing the things that need to be done in therapy. So that's where I see medication having a very strong benefit. Um, and so these are the components. You don't want someone just coming in just chatting about your feelings. You want the kids to learn some uh, bit of skills. So they have to examine their thinking and feeling. Uh, as we talked about educating them, which we talked about, uh, involving the parents and schools. Schools just if it's needed or if you wish. Um, you don't have to involve the schools necessarily, but many times they can be uh, very helpful. Um, so the parents in this case, um, you don't want to have the kid just go into therapy, talk to the person and then to sleep, you would want to be involved as well. Uh, facing fears and a therapist more as a coach than an expert. Um, being an expert will turn everybody off. Um, so you really want to be, and I do always say this whenever I have a kid in here, so I may, you know, go back, I'll look at this hierarchy and then I'll say, you know what next I want to do is I want to bring in a real spider, you know, for you to hang out or I want you to catch a spider. Um, and show it to your mom and they'll say, well, you know, that's, that's way too much. Um, don't you think I did well enough? And I always tell them, I always think they do. You have to acknowledge where they are. You are a coach and a coach never lets the swimmer just say, oh, you're swimming fast enough. <laughs> you don't need to do any more. You, you're hitting the ball enough times. They're there to push. So I want to reiterate that it's, a, you know, we're just trying to push them while they're in therapy to get to as extreme as they can. So when the normal things that pop up during the day happen, they do okay. So um, this is us, uh, this is uh, the age group we serve, um, 8 to 17 years old. Um, we, uh, we don't go below 8, not because anxiety doesn't exist, so that's always a good question I get. People say, well, I have little ones with it. Um, yes, it's just that we use fMRI research and it's easier uh, for the older kids to lay still. That's probably pretty much the bottom line. Um, also in terms of uh, psychotherapy, the little little ones, uh, it's harder to do this type of cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, if you do have a tiny bitty one with it, uh, you would do most of the therapy, so the parent would get coached 
to helping the kid work through things. Uh, the parents would help um, push the behavioral end of things. Uh, again, if I do get the tiny ones, which, you know, you would do it all pretty much behaviorally and parent educated wise. Um, you know, we, so we have, um, that's our age group range. We uh, provide medical evaluations. We provide uh, psychotherapy. Uh, so we get, you can have medication or therapy. Um, and that is usually about eight to 12 weeks of, um, of therapy we give. Um, the participants in our studies, though, because we're interested in the brain, um, must be medically healthy and not be taking currently any psychiatric medications. Um, so that is one of the limitations of our study, but we want to see what the brain is doing without medication. Um, so to participate, for you, those of you in the D.C. metro area, um, that top number is a research assistant, um, the 301-402-8225. Um, she's very good at kind of explaining what our studies involve, um, time-wise, um, and also they help you if you're interested in starting the process of enrolling or at least being interviewed to see if you would fit. Um, and the second number is uh, Lucy, the nurse that I work with very closely. She does uh, most of the evaluations and does the phone screens, so just so you know who those two people are. Um, so again, that's us. Um, these are general resources, so NIMH, NIH.gov, join the study. So if you're looking also, there are studies on bipolar disorder, uh, mood, so um, disruptive mood uh, disorder, dysregulation disorder, um, ADHD, um, autism spectrum, so you can find all that there. Um, this is a good link for uh, to find therapists that are um, really specifically trained in cognitive behavioral therapy. Uh, about our kids.org helps just have, it's the NYU Child Study Center that has just some good links, free links. Um, this is a good book. Um, a good book on ADHD, <laughs> sorry about that. Um, and then uh, obviously um, that is a great book at the bottom. I always say you might as well start with a book. Um, see if that will be all you need. Sometimes it's all you need with anxiety. Um, and then from then on, you can see if you need um, extra uh, resources. So uh, I covered a lot in a very short amount of time. Um, so thank you all very much for attending. Um, and, you know, Kayleen will obviously uh, send out a copy of the PowerPoint, um, you know, and we may have more in the future. So thank you very much.